Blog Talk Radio. Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust. Broadcasting Live presents Two Guys and a Bible with Don Preston and William Bell. Join us each week at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central as we bring you exciting, sound, challenging, and comforting messages regarding the end times. Thank you for tuning in today. Don Preston is the founder of Preterist Research Institute, or PRI. Dunn is a prolific author, having written and published 19 books, a host of audio and DVD studies, and is a debater and defender of the full preterist view. His websites are BibleProphecy.com, Eschatology.org, and DonKPreston.com. William Bell is the founder of AllThingsFulfilled.com Ministries and has a website bearing the same name, and has authored three books, audios and DVDs. He has published hundreds of articles and recordings. And now, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Two Guys in a Bible broadcast with Don Preston and William Bell. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Two Guys in the Bible broadcast right here on Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust. I am William Bell, and unfortunately today, Dr. Don Preston will not be with us. Um, he is ill at the present, and so we solicit your prayers on his behalf. Uh, hopefully, he'll be feeling better. I uh, got a call from him around noon today uh, to let me know that he wasn't going to be able to make the broadcast. And so uh, I know that that is a huge um, disappointment for many, but nevertheless, you know, we continue on. Uh, but we certainly appreciate him and definitely will uh, miss his um, teaching and lessons for the um, for the evening. Nevertheless, we are grateful for the privilege and for the opportunity to be here to uh, continue to share messages with you. Um, usually we kind of chat a little bit about what's going on in both of our worlds. So I suppose either he has sent the rain this way and um, they're enjoying sunshine now or he may still be um, uh you know, um, paddling through the water, but I know that we've had a lot of rain here in the Memphis area, and uh, I thought for a moment that uh, we were going to have to go out and build a boat, but looks like it has um, ceased for the moment, and the sunshine is out, and so we are uh, grateful for uh, for that, and um, just looking forward to um, great weather, hopefully, but it uh, looks like it's getting hot already. And I don't know if I'm ready for the heat. Uh, I don't know if you're ready for the heat, depending on where you are listening to this. But uh, it, I know it comes with uh, quite a bit of humility. Uh, humil- humi- humility, uh, excuse me, uh, when we talk about, you know, the heat. Uh, nevertheless, we look forward to um, um, uh, continually working along the way. Um, little announcement um, for uh, the... Let's see, starting on around the 16th, I'm going to be leaving for uh, Ghana once again. Uh, Solicit your prayers on my behalf. Uh, We'll be there working with Solomon in one area and a gentleman by the name of William in another area. And uh, we're trying to get some things underway uh, in terms of of, um, really beefing up some activity there. There's a lot of opportunity going on. And so very grateful for the uh, privilege and for the opportunity to do that. Um, I know there's a lot going on with the uh, COVID situation, so we are uh, hopeful in our prayers that everything will be fine on that end. Um, India has certainly had some challenges. Uh, we got a call from Prabhu Das, or at least an email um, from him not long ago, I think about a week or so ago, uh, saying that, um, and this was before I heard anything in the news about it, that the situation in India was uh, really becoming very serious with um, a, just an alarming number of growing cases. And <clears throat> some members of his family were affected. And as you know, many of you know, uh, concerning Prabhu Das, he has been around for a long time. He is called the Indian Preterist and um, is also the author of a book or maybe books by this time and has um, been 
teaching covenant eschatology for quite some time. So I uh, pray for him and for his family, uh, for uh, the people there. I've also been working with uh, Adamala Hanuk, who runs the um, now uh, the All Things Fulfill Preacher Training School in uh, India. And um, they generally uh, train somewhere between 25 to maybe 35 uh, or more students every year and training men to preach the gospel. Uh, He has fully adopted uh, covenant eschatology uh, as a um, course of teaching in the school uh, along with the other biblical studies that they do. And um, does a lot of evangelistic work. I think the last meeting that he held uh, in terms of um, evangelism, he had about 300 people who had gathered, and out of that 300, they baptized about 12 people. Almost every time we do studies with him, and Dale, uh, Dale uh, Robbins um, has also been engaged in that work, both in terms of uh, helping to uh, financially support the work, as well as um, doing some teaching as well, and, and just uh, the moral support and encouragement. And that has had a tremendous impact on what they're doing. And from that perspective, um, you know, every meeting that we have uh, results in, you know, maybe three, four, five, six or seven uh, baptisms. And so they're doing uh, some good work. Uh, And that just tells you a lot about the uh, diligence of Brother Hannock, about his uh, leadership and organizational skills, the team of preachers that he has with him and they're always um encouraged you know encouraging when we uh, when we speak with them uh it's just just really really um amazing to um to have that experience and so those are just some of the things that are taking place um we continue as you know don mentions from time to time to get um comments in from others about the work that's being done and usually when we do People will tell me, you know, I came across you through Dunn Preston and um, vice versa. And so uh, that is the uh, unity of our uh, work that, you know, we cross promote each other. Um, Dunn Preston's morning musings as both on YouTube as well as on the Now Network. And speaking of which, uh, when we talk about the Now Network, um, as you know, they increased their coverage to Uh, about 83 new countries uh, some time ago, just a little little over a month ago, I believe. And then recently they announced a a downloadable app that you can choose so that if you wanted all of the uh, broadcasts uh, for one particular speaker, and there may be a, a, um, yeah, you would be able to do that. Now, I haven't subscribed to that yet because – there is an additional fee. Of course, we are, uh, in order to enable us to be on the um, broadcast, you know, we have uh, very loyal uh, and uh, subscribers and uh, supporters who have uh, made that possible for us and for which we are extremely grateful and thankful. Uh, it has been uh, one of the um, best supported platforms that we have um, taken, uh, undertaken uh, in the past. And I think we've been on now probably going on two years if it hasn't been two years, but, you know, it's getting close to two years. Um, And so we're uh, grateful for that. But uh, they have um, another option to have a, a downloadable app, which they have, that would allow you to have all of the programs listed together. Uh, so that if you wanted to listen to all of Dunn's programs, you could, or if you wanted to listen to all of our programs or all of both of our programs, uh, you could, and, you know, without having to wait for uh, Friday or Saturday, whenever the two uh, broadcasts are there, uh, you'll be able to do that and uh, have all of that material, you know, right there available for you. I know that, you know, many people continue to ask um, or at least appreciate on the YouTube channel when we have um, all of the videos in a particular on a particular subject or theme, 
when they're in a playlist so that they can access them and keep track of them. Because I can tell you from my point of view, it is difficult for me to, you know, after I get past the number five to just keep counting and be accurate in the counting. So if you run across some of my videos, they probably will be numbered all uh, out of whack. I'm doing a little bit better um, with these, uh, with the series I'm doing now, uh, trying to keep track of that and making sure that the, that the numbers are sequential and I don't get things out of place. But the, one of the reasons that happened in the past is, you know, after you, especially if you're doing a series and you try to record them all uh, either in advance or before, um, you know, the time that you have allotted, you know, the sequence that you're going to uh, uh, publish them, then you forget, at least I do forget. Um, either I don't write it down or I just, you know, assume that I know. And then I end up, you know, getting a number out of place. So number five might be number four and number four and numbers, you know, six might be number eight. Or if I go back and download the videos from Facebook, you know, I've got a ton of them before I, you know, start that process. So now I'm trying to keep up with that, make sure that happens. Um, I know Dunn has um, a uh, very good support team that, you know, manages all of his. Unfortunately, I don't. So it, it makes it much more difficult, you know, to try to keep all of that coordinated and to do it. But nevertheless, um, you know, that's what that's all about. So when you can get all of them in one place uh, where you can access them, it makes it easier uh, for you to share them as well, because, um, you know, when you have questions that come up and people want to know the answers, and this is what I do sometimes, especially if it's a subject that I've covered and people ask me to explain it, and I get that a lot, <laughs> And uh, and we appreciate the questions coming in, but that's one of the reasons why we do the videos and why we do the recorded broadcast, et cetera, so that this material is available for you. And so it should be used um, for that end. And I don't know about Dunn. I know that there are some people, you know, you, you listen to them and they can do the same thing the same way every single time. I'm not one of them. It's going to come out different. I don't care. Um you know, whether I do it one or a hundred times, something's going to be different in the process. But nevertheless, and that's a good thing as long as you're continuing to study and you continue to, you know, work at uh, something. It should be that way because you're enhancing your knowledge and your experience in treating with the subject. You become exposed to more things. There's new material being published that needs to be uh, covered or there are new situations that come up and new questions that come up that, you know, maybe were not at hand at the time that you began. And so there is a reason uh, for that. But nevertheless, the uh, whole point of that is that when someone asks the question, if it's on one of these subjects and themes that we've covered, um, then direct them to the video because they'll get a lot more information if they're really seeking to understand and um, want to know, then, you know, if you got them all there, you can just, you know, quickly and easily direct them to it and there they have it. So uh, that makes sense from that point of view. But that's uh, what's uh, going on. I hope that uh, everybody is doing well. In some places, it looks like there might be a little bit of reprieve coming. And, you know, from this COVID situation where, you know, people can, you know, get out of their houses, uh, maybe take some of the masks off occasionally and, um, you know, get out and breathe some fresh air. Um let some of the pent up frustrations that occur from being um, sort of under house arrest. I'm just saying that, you know, uh, tongue in cheek, uh, you know, just, but, you know, when you think about it, because a lot of people won't venture out because they're so afraid that um, they're going to contract COVID. And so they don't um, even venture to go out or do so as little as possible. You know, the children are climbing the walls, <laughs> hanging from the ceilings, et cetera. Uh, because they don't get the opportunity to go out and uh, expend some energy. And so with that, uh looks like things may be in some places opening up. I know that some governors around the country uh, have uh, decided to open up their states and uh, get people back to normal, uh, or at least, as they say, the new normal, whatever that um, may be and may look like. And, you know, added to that is all of the other stresses that people have gone through with, you know, loss of jobs, loss of businesses, and just trying to make it from day to day, waiting on stimulus checks and all of these kind of things, and what that's going to look like on the other side. 
And then while at the same time, there may be some reprieve from that, there is also the um, situation where uh, other countries, you know, like India uh, that we were talking about a moment ago, uh, are experiencing an upturn in these uh, in these cases. And, you know, it's interesting. I read an article um, and watched a video concerning that, you know, after, uh, as I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, that Prabhu Das had sent me the message through email, you know, telling me about what was going on and asking for prayers, et cetera, on behalf of that. And once again, remind you, you know, please uh, do so on his behalf. But when, uh, you know, after he had sent that message and, and I was already aware of that, um, I don't know if someone sent me the video or I was just on YouTube, maybe surfing around, searching, and uh, this video pops up with uh, Bill Gates. And he was being interviewed and questioned about the sharing of patents for the vaccines uh, because there were people in various poor countries who did not have access to the uh, to the vaccines that wanted them. And as a result, you know, they were um, really uh, experiencing, you know, a lot of um, cases, you know, and and deaths as a result. And so when he was questioned about it, um, he emphatically said, no, he wasn't going to share them because he felt like, one, they didn't have the capacity in order to uh, manufacture the vaccines. In other words, they didn't have state-of-the-art facilities, uh, the, I guess, the trained personnel, uh, the technical know-how, et cetera, to produce vaccines. And for that reason, you know, he said, well, it's a long process, and that he was totally against sharing the uh, the vaccines, which what that meant was also that if they are shared, that these um, places that would uh, use these vaccines would be able to um, produce them at lower cost, you know, like generic products, et cetera. Uh, they could, uh, I guess, you know, for want of a better term, re-engineer them to the extent that they use, you know, I guess, different processes to uh, create them and thus greatly reduce the cost of them, making them more available to people who wanted them. And um, he said no. And the whole aim, it appears, was that um, this was supposed to be something that was going to help the world. And of course, if you think about it, and this is supposed to be a very, um, um, how shall I say it, you know, a, a disease or, or virus that, you know, spreads so that you got to stay, you know, six feet away from people and you got to wear a mask and you got to use, you know, uh, gallons of hand sanitizer and things of that nature and, you know, always wash and, and keep yourself, you know, hygienically uh, clean. Uh, from that point of view, then why would you risk someone else not having what they needed if that's what they desired, if they really felt that this was important? Why would you risk that and, um, you know, have the potential that this continues to spread everywhere uh, from that perspective? But here was the irony of the situation that was revealed in that little video clip, that India was one of the world's top producing uh, or top vaccine producing countries, um, that they had impeccable standards. And even as the video demonstrated, they had a state-of-the-art facility, uh, all of the uh, medical requirements, and the the environmental requirements for a state of the art facility that was only being used to a third of its capacity. So while Bill Gates were saying that these countries didn't have it, here was India, that is a world producer of very safe and effective vaccines, with a facility that could handle the capacity, and yet was being totally underutilized and um, you know, you've got somebody saying, well, no, I control these patents, so to speak, and we're not going to let them out. And so just 
in essence, let the people die um, as a result. But anyway, that's uh, how that situation uh, kind of developed and, and uh, is going on. And so there's a lot of pushback uh, concerning um, that situation. And uh, so we just hope and pray that, you know, whatever the remedies are for uh, for these people, that they can get them so that they have, you know, access. And, and at the same time, um, the two countries like the United States and um, the UK, for example, I believe, uh, were two that were mentioned, had excess um, supply of the vaccines. So that's rather interesting when you, you know, look at it, uh, that they had excess supply. And I think it was a difference of maybe one out of four people in India who had received the vaccine. And you had like one out of, um, uh, no, one out of four, maybe in America or something to that extent. I can't remember what those numbers were, uh, but I'm sure, you know, you can look them up compared to one out of 500 or, or something to that degree. Uh, in India. So that shows the disparity uh, between them. But nevertheless, you know, I know people have certain opinions about, you know, the vaccines uh, to begin with, and there are all kind of uh, news reports coming out about them, but that's just an interesting situation for you to consider uh, regarding it. But nevertheless, uh, I think that's uh, as much as we want to talk about, um, you know, from that perspective. And we want to get to uh, something uh, regarding the lesson today. Uh, We've been studying from Ezekiel chapter 47. uh, And in recent weeks, um, recent lessons, we've talked about the land and Don was introducing uh, some concepts regarding the land. So we want to look at that just a little bit, say, you know, a few things about it that um, may be helpful for you. Uh, I know that you know, this is one of the areas where he's done a lot of work, and uh, I haven't done as much work in terms of, you know, looking at the land. But it is an interesting, uh, it is an interesting topic, especially as it transitions from uh, the old covenant to the new covenant, and uh, from, you know, the prophecies that are mentioned regarding it. But uh, Ezekiel 47, beginning at verse 21, is a um, a key text regarding the land and. Uh, when you speak about the land, you're talking about the uh, the inheritance, which we'll say some things about uh, as we move forward in the lesson. But nevertheless, in verse 21, he says, Thus you shall divide this land among yourselves according to the tribes of Israel. It shall be that you will divide it by lot as an inheritance for yourselves and for the strangers who dwell among you and who bear children among you, they shall be to you as native born among the children of Israel. They shall have an inheritance with you among the tribes of Israel. And it shall be that in whatever tribe the stranger dwells, there you shall give him his inheritance, says the Lord. So we have in Ezekiel 47 uh, the text that speaks about the land being uh, distributed in terms of the inheritance. And of course, here we have the land being um, given as an inheritance, you know, divided by lot for Israel, when he says for yourselves, and then he says, and for the strangers who dwell among you and who bear children among you. And saying that they shall be to you as native born among the children of Israel. So these would be people who were not uh, native born Israelites, but yet because they were among them, they would have the privilege and the opportunity to have an inheritance in the land. Now, we do have those who uh, believe in this exclusivity of Israel and that You know, it's only uh, the 12 tribes who were to be the beneficiaries of the promises of the inheritance. And that, from my perspective, runs counter to the prophecies that we have in Ezekiel and elsewhere in the scriptures, uh, speaking about the inheritance of the land. 
Uh, in addition, as we've pointed out in the broadcast and in, in previous lessons, that the land promises are transformed from real estate to um, redemption to salvation in Christ. Um, I know that makes some, you know, very um, irritated, you might say, because they believe that this uh, land promise is still valid, that uh, this gives validity to people who have claimed the land, and that others who have uh, these forward-looking prophecies, these futuristic uh, tendencies for Israel, that uh, these land promises are yet to be fulfilled. Um, you've got several groups. You know, you've got the Hebrew Israelites, and of course, you know, people um, talk about them having exclusive rights to the land. You've got the people who um, are the modern state of Israel claiming rights to the land. Um, and then you have the people who were dwelling in the land before um, 1948 claiming, you know, rights to the land. So there's a lot of controversy regarding the piece of real estate that uh, people are clamoring over. But uh, that's not what the scripture is focused on when we look at Ezekiel uh, 47. Uh, we're talking about uh, the inheritance uh, in the gospel, the inheritance that uh, God promised to Abraham that formed the basis of the uh, land promise um, regarding the fulfillment in the New Testament. And so when it comes down to this particular land, uh, this is a land that was not just simply for Israel, but it was for um, a broader scope. And that is indicated in this term and in this concept uh, where he says, they shall be to you as native born. Uh, this is for the strangers who dwell among you. Now, you know, I know this was a text that has been covered before, but I want to uh, look at it again. When we look in Exodus chapter 12, the 12th chapter of the book of Exodus, uh, you have similar language that speaks about the stranger who was in the land. And In verse 48, the text says, And when a stranger dwells with you and wants to keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as a native of the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat it. So here we are with the stranger who was dwelling among among Israel. And of course, this is, you know, before there was any division or split in the 12 tribes, um, you had the whole uh, nation of Israel here, but yet there were strangers who dwelt among them. So um, I can't see how it makes any sense to claim that these might've been, you know, the Northern tribe versus the Southern tribe, et cetera. Uh, these were clearly strangers who were among the 12 tribes, and that's the way the Bible uses the, uh, the term here in Ezekiel chapter 12 and verse 48. And so it says, and he shall be as a native of the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat it. And um, that was the reason that he had to be circumcised. And, of course, you know, with Dunn's new book coming out where he talks about the importance of circumcision, of course, um, uh, I'm sure some of this material is covered, but he says one law shall be for the native born and for the stranger who dwells among you. Thus, all the children of Israel did as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. So they did. And uh, it came to pass on that very same day that the Lord brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, according to their army. So uh, you had um, along with Israel and, you know, he tells you even in verse 38 of the same uh, chapter uh, 37 and 38 then the children of israel journeyed from ramses to succoth about 600,000 men on foot besides children a mixed multitude went up with them also and flocks and herds and a great deal of livestock so they had this mixed multitude among them they had uh, many of the strangers among them because through all of the signs and wonders that god did in egypt many of them were convinced that this was the true god that was the reason 
that God did those things. Um, you know, we've been studying Ezekiel coming along uh, in a sort of a verse by verse study along the way. But, you know, so many times over and over and over again in the uh, book of Ezekiel, just as he does in, in other books and even in Exodus here, uh, when God does uh, one of these um, amazing acts that, you know, no one could do but God, uh, he would tell them, you know, when I do this thing, then you shall know that I am the Lord. And so it wasn't just Israel who had the benefit and the privilege of seeing these actions done. It was also the people who were among the nations. And that's one of the reasons why when Israel uh, sojourned and, and uh, traveled through the land, that many of the nations had already heard about them before they entered the land. Uh, and they said so. You know, we have heard how you have uh, gone about and licked up all the nations, so to speak. And uh, they've heard about the God of Israel. And so that was God's way of declaring himself among the nations, letting them know that, you know, this was the God. And, of course, they associated, you know, uh, war and victory in war with the triumphant God. And so here is God, you know, destroying all of these nations um, round about as they journey through them. And so all of these nations are getting the word that this was the true and living God. And so as a result of that, uh, some of these people were, you know, joining them. And that particularly happened uh, in the time of the Exodus. And it continued to happen along the way. Um, when we look, uh, for example, in the book of Esther, you have a similar situation going on, um, and that is the time that they, uh, many of the people, uh, during this time that they were um, in uh, captivity and they were about to be destroyed, but one of the things that uh, happened when they published this uh, decree, and uh, you'll see in, in verse 13 of Exodus, I mean, excuse me, not Exodus, but Esther, chapter 6 and verse 13, when they notified the king, Ahasuerus, of the plot to destroy all of the Jews, um, and they published this document, and it was issued as a decree in every province and published to all the people so that the Jews would be ready on that day to avenge themselves on their enemies because the plot was to destroy all of them and uh, to just wipe them off the face of the earth, if you please. And so the text says the couriers who rode on royal horses went out hastened and pressed on by the king's command and the decree was issued in Shushan, the citadel. So Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel uh, of blue and white with a great crown of gold and a garment of fine linen and purple in the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. And the Jews had light and gladness, joy and honor. I mean, they've been informed. They now uh, can prepare themselves for what was taking place so they wouldn't be, you know, overtaken by surprise. But the end result of that was also the conversion of other people who were outside of the nation it says and in every province verse 17 and city wherever the king's command and decree came the jews had joy and gladness a feast and a holiday then many of the people of the land became jews because fear of the jews fell upon them so that this was another one of those uh, cases, another one of those examples. But it says many of the people of the land became Jews. And so we have this case where, you know, God was not uh, averse and against people who were considered strangers or not native born joining themselves to Israel and um and that was the case here, it was the case in the Exodus, and this is what is implied in the fulfillment or the inheritance uh, that is fulfilled uh, from an eschatological perspective in Ezekiel 47, uh, because, you know, once again, in verse 22, he says, it shall be that you will divide 
it by lot as an inheritance for yourselves and for the strangers who dwell among you and who bear children among you. They shall be to you as native born among the children of Israel. They shall have an inheritance with you among the tribes of Israel. And so it shall be that in whatever tribe the stranger dwells, there you shall give him his inheritance, says the Lord God. Um, that's, you know, rather counter. You know, at the present time, um, in the state of Israel, they are dealing with a lot of, of um, pushback and negative press regarding charges of apartheid. And, of course, uh, that argument was used against them during the um, South Africa uh, situation. And, of course, they tried to stay very, very far away from um, these charges of apartheid because of their uh, attempt to cleanse the land from the Arabs and, uh, you know, make that claim that this is a um, this is a place only for, quote, um, Jews, and um, they want to expel them. And the treatment of the Palestinians is something that, you know, they feel justified in doing. Of course, um, you know, we've done quite a bit of study uh, in that area, just looking at those situations. But uh, just recently, and I can't remember who it was, but um, um, someone charged them with uh, apartheid. And they were fuming over it because they didn't want anybody else in the land other than themselves. Now, as I understand it, I don't think that they consider themselves all 12 tribes. Um, I think they consider themselves just Jews. Well, that wouldn't be all 12 tribes, but nevertheless, they want the land to be all Jews. Um, it's just kind of an interesting point uh, when you think about it. And I know at the present time, they're, you know, they're talking about um, um, taking over about 1,500 houses or you know, properties that belong to the Arabs uh, at this time. And, of course, there's, there's pushback going on regarding it. But look at how different that situation is compared to the um, statement that is made here that they shall be to you as native born. And yet you have a situation where if people wanted to give, and this, this is a message for the, um, the Christian Zionists out there as well. Um, you've got a situation here where they uh, want to claim that this is the fulfillment of prophecy. So why are they not in harmony with the prophecy? Why are they not reading the prophecy that says they would divide the land by lot as an inheritance for yourselves and for the strangers who dwell among you? There's nothing in this text that says that they were to um, push these people out of the land into the edges of the sea. Uh, there's nothing that says they were to, you know, put them into an open prison. There's nothing that says that they were to treat them as non-Israelites. I mean, if they could become Jews, according to Esther, uh, chapter 6, and what was that, verse 17, then why couldn't they become such here? Not that necessarily they want to, but he tells them uh, they would be to you as native born among the children of Israel, and they shall have an inheritance with you. Yet they don't want them to have any space in the land. They want them totally pushed out of the land. So that can't be what's under discussion here in Ezekiel 47. And it shows, um, you know, it's just another example of why uh, these prophecies are not to be interpreted from that perspective, 
uh, when you look at them, at least, you know, when you kind of draw that subject out a bit. But nevertheless, uh, it's just contrary to even what the Bible taught um, regarding it. They shall have an inheritance with you among the tribes of Israel, and it shall be that in whatever tribe the stranger dwells, there you shall give him his inheritance. In other words, every tribe he's in, he is supposed to have his inheritance, says the Lord God. Now, what's interesting in all of this is the fact that um, there is no physical land inheritance that was the subject of the um, of the text uh, in the first place. And this land is in the new city. So when we talk about the land, we have to at the same time talk about the city uh, because the land's in the city. The temple is in the land. And so now we have a situation where we have the temple, we have the land, we have the city. But it's also uh, when you begin to talk about the city and the land, you have to talk about the covenant as well. And all of these uh, things that we've been discussing in terms of these Old Testament promises and uh, Israel and the strangers dwelling among them, uh, such as in Exodus and in um, Esther and other passages, were involving things that were a part of the Old Covenant. But you see, the argument is made that this was supposed to be a um, perpetual covenant, an everlasting covenant that was made with um, Israel and that uh, they had the promise of the land and that this uh, land was never uh, to um, uh, be removed from their possession. Well, that runs counter to quite a few passages in the um, in the Bible, in the scriptures, and we can see that the land was a uh, there was a covenant promise with the land, and this covenant promise is encouched with uh, even the subject of circumcision, as we uh, mentioned in some previous lessons. For example, in uh, Genesis chapter 17, in Genesis 17, you'll note uh, the conditionality of the premise, even regarding uh, Israelites, even regarding those who were among Israel. Uh, when we start in Genesis 17 and verse 8, the text says, Also I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession. So note that we've got the land, understand that we have an everlasting possession mentioned. And he says, and I will be their God. And we've got a relationship with God all in the same text. I will give you and your descendants the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So there's real estate. There is the everlasting possession, and there is the relationship. And he says in verse 9, And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants. Now look at that. As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. So there's a covenant aspect to this land and to the relationship and to the everlasting possession. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. So here is circumcision being given as a sign of the covenant between um, God and his people. And of course, he tells him that 
Everyone who was eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male child in your generations, he who is born in your house or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant. Notice, even here in the text, in verse 12, let me read it once again. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male child in your generations, he who is born in your house. And a generation, that term comes, you know, that's genealogy. So those are the people who were the bloodline. Every male child in your generations, he who is born in your house. But notice, or bought with your money from any foreigner. So these were not native-born people. They were bought with money from the foreigner who is not your descendant. How much more explicit could the text get when he tells them and compares those who were his generation, born in his house, or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant. He who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money must be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. He's out of covenant with God that ends his relationship, and likewise, it ends his entitlement to the land, and therefore, his participation in the everlasting possession. So the breaking of the covenant became the basis of the cutting off of natural born as well as foreign born Israelites those who had joined themselves to them so you can have an everlasting possession and break the covenant and forfeit your right to the everlasting possession that is precisely the text says regarding Israel. And so looking at it from this perspective, uh, we should not assume or conclude that um, just because Israel had the land, the natural descendants had the land, that it meant and because it was an everlasting possession, and even because they had a relationship with God, that it meant that they couldn't forfeit it based on the breaking of the covenant. And that's what God charges them with. So much so that he said he was going to make a new covenant with them. Let's turn to Jeremiah. Now remember, uh, we pointed out that this land involved the city. And, of course, through the city was the temple, which is or should help us to define what we're looking at as far as this land is concerned. But the promise that is being made here in Ezekiel 47 is an eschatological premise and therefore deals directly with the inheritance of the land or the land promises as related to 
the inheritance. And that within itself is a very intriguing and interesting uh, concept. But let's take a look, for example, in Jeremiah chapter 31 regarding the land promises and the promise of the city and the covenant promise because they're all related and speaking of which the relationship to God now in Jeremiah 31 we have three points that are mentioned all introduced by the phrase behold the days are coming in verse 27 he says behold the days are coming says the lord that i will sow the house of israel and the house of judah with the seed of man and the seed of beast and it shall come to pass that as i've watched over them to pluck up to break down to throw down to destroy and to afflict, so I will watch over them to build and to plant, says the Lord. Look, this is a total tearing down of the nation and a rebuilding, a total digging up Israel from the roots and replanting them. And notice, so I will watch over them to build and to plant, says the Lord. In those days, they shall say no more. The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. But everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Every man who eats the sour grapes, his teeth shall be set on edge. But here's the point. This is where God says, I am going to sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Now, one point that Paul makes in 1 Corinthians 15, and the same Jesus makes in John 12, 24, is that you do not sow the body that shall be. So if we have Israel as the body of Moses, and God saying, behold, the days are coming that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah, with the seed of man and with the seed of beast, he's not going to sow them in the state that they are or were at the time so that they come back in the same state. That is against the law of sowing and reaping. Paul said, you do not sow the body that shall be. They were the body of Moses, Jude 9. And the reason that he would not sow them so that they would be the same body, I mean, you know, can you imagine a farmer going out and planting a bean seed? And then when he goes to harvest, a bean comes up. And that's all he's got is a bean. No, that's not the way it works. It doesn't come up the same bean that he sowed. It doesn't come up the same um, uh, form. You know, it comes up as a plant. And, of course, the plant produces, but it's transformed from the body that it had that was, that was sown. And that was the argument that Paul makes and the same one that Jesus made. And it comes up a lot more, of course, as well. But the point is, here is God saying, I'm going to sow them. And he already indicates that there was going to be some change when he says, in those days they shall no more say, the father has eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge, uh, but everyone shall die for his own iniquity, etc. So he's already indicating there would be some change in what was taking place. But the, the point is, there was a time coming in which they would be sown. Now, in verse 31, he uses the same phrase. And he says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. 
Now, remember, in the previous verse, he said he's going to sow the house of Israel with the, uh, and the house of Judah with the seed of man and the seed of beast. And here he says he's going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And I would take both of those texts as somewhat elliptical, or at least this one, to include everything that he said in verse 27. But he says, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers. You see, there is some change going on. They're being sown, but they're not going to be sown back into the same covenant. It's a different covenant altogether. And the different covenant is of a different nature, and its results are different as well. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Watch this. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them says the Lord. So he says they broke the covenant. Well, if they broke the covenant, that forfeited their right to an everlasting possession, to a relationship with God, and uh, to the land. And when you trace out Israel's history, they have a history of breaking that covenant And that's what Jesus charged them with in Matthew 23 and what the apostles charged them with in 1 Thessalonians 2, 14 through 16. And so God's wrath would come upon them because of the breaking of that covenant that wherein they had forfeited the land promises, etc., And that's why you have Stephen or the the, um, leaders in Israel saying concerning Stephen, we've heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth is coming to destroy this place and to change the customs delivered to us by Moses. And so he says, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds. And write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be, or they shall be my people. So now he has a relationship with them that is different, a covenant with them that is different, terms of the covenant that are different, and the blessings of the covenant are different. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity. And their sin I will remember no more. See, the inheritance is changing from land to salvation from sin. Now, one other point in the few minutes remaining, and that is found in verse 38. So we've got a new covenant, but next we have the new city, which is the new land. He says, behold, the days are coming, introduced by the same phrase, says the Lord, that the city shall be built for the Lord from the tower of Hananel to the corner gate. The surveyor's line shall again extend straight forward over the hill, Gareb, then it shall turn toward Goath, and the whole valley of the dead bodies and of the ashes and all the fields as far as the brook Kedron to the corner of the horse gate toward the east shall be holy to the Lord. It shall not be plucked up or thrown down anymore forever. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the land of the new covenant that is not subject to invasion by foreigners. That is the land where sin is removed. That is the land into which Israel has been transformed and sown that embraces not just the tribes of Israel, but the foreigners and the strangers as well. And unfortunately, I'm out of time. I'd like to develop this further, but I'm going to leave that for Dr. Dunn when he comes back on next week to take it in whatever direction he chooses. I hope that you've gained some insights from the message today. It has been a pleasure being with you. 
I miss my comrade. Hope that he's doing well. Continue for him uh, in your prayers, as well as for Prabhu Das, the people of India, and the other people around the world who are suffering at the lack of the greed of others and the uncharitableness of others. I'm William Bell, and on behalf of Two Guys in the Bible, we say God bless, and may God keep you until next time. Thank you for joining the Two Guys in a Bible radio broadcast. On behalf of Dunn Preston and myself, we'd like to say have a very pleasant day and may God bless. Until next time, we'll see you on Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust. <laughs>